Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. I think we all have our own list of essential editing tools and techniques that are critical to the way we operate from a post-processing perspective. And I believe everyone's photo editing workflow is ever-changing and constantly evolving as post-processing software and camera technology and our own internal skill set are always advancing and progressing and improving. And in this video, I want to share with you the tools and techniques that I couldn't live without. These are the things that I consider to be must-have items that are mission critical to my post-processing workflow. And some of them are tools and others are techniques that I'm constantly using in all of my landscape photos. So for this video, this is the image we're gonna be working on. As you can tell, this of course is the raw file. This was a four or maybe five shot vertical panorama. I can't remember exactly. And this is the finished image right here, which I'm, I'm really happy with the way it came out. I've never shared this image before, mainly because it has one critical error associated with it. In my haste when I was on location, I was kind of rushing around because the, there wasn't a whole lot of color or light in the sky, but it started to appear and I started to rush around a little bit. I got sloppy and made a very big uh, compositional error, which could have easily been resolved if I would have just shifted over a few feet to the left. But the issue is right here where I didn't create any separation between the actual lighthouse and the coastline here, which is definitely my bad. I don't think it completely ruins the photograph, but it really could have been much, much better. But overall, I, I am happy with the, uh, the image. So I did break this video down into three separate sections with the first section being something that I call getting localized. Now, I think the increased use of local adjustments was a, a turning point for me for, uh, for my editing workflow. And I think that's the case for many folks as well. I believe the gradual transition away from a workflow that consists only of global adjustments, I think that's a very big sign of a positive progression. So to jump right into it, this is the, actually that's the, the, uh, the final version. This is the version that we're gonna be working on right through here. I went ahead and added all of these global adjustments already in, in the essence of time. Now, as far as local adjustments are concerned, there's really three ways to do it inside of Lightroom. One way I never really use, and that's the actual adjustment brush. I just find it creates an opportunity for me to, to, to create a adjustment that just looks a little bit too unnatural. So I very rarely ever use the actual adjustment brush, but I always use the radio filter. And what I love about the radio filter is the fact that I'm always finding different and unique ways to use it on, uh, on different types of images. And this image right here was one of those photographs. So what I wanted to do, so I'm gonna open up the radio filter right here. I'm gonna hit new. And I wanna drag it right over the actual bulb of the lighthouse right through there. I wanted to just kind of brighten that up a little bit. So I'm just gonna increase the exposure a touch, maybe bring up the highlights a little bit, make sure the feather's at 100%, toggle this on and off so this is before and after, maybe even brighten it up a little bit more just so you can easily see it at home. Add a little bit of contrast in there maybe as well. So this is before and after, before and after. And that's just, that's one of the, the many different ways to, to use the radio filter. I usually use it for dodging and burning all the time, but what I love to do is whenever there is a structure in your image, I think the radio filter is fantastic for creating that, that three-dimensional feel to it. And this is a perfect example right here. As we can see, easily see that the lighthouse is circular, but it looks a little bit flat because it just looks kind of shaded across the whole entire uh, side that we can see. But you can tell that this side has a little bit more light than this side. So we're gonna just exaggerate that a little bit. Drag a radial filter right through here. Maybe tilt it over a touch expand it some here and we're going to increase the exposure a little bit nothing crazy maybe about right there looks good and i'm going to right click duplicate and we're going to do the same thing over here but in the opposite direction so let me just straighten this up some kind of bring this over a little bit i want them to overlap some just to make that transition a little bit more seamless and we're just going to darken this side down just a little bit maybe just a little bit more there, and if we toggle this on and off, let me just hit close, and this is before and after, before and after. So that definitely made a big difference. So whenever there's any kind of structure or anything in your, your scene, you can do this with big logs or branches if you wanted to. Whatever side is a little bit darker, put a radio filter over it and darken that side a little bit more and do the opposite treatment to the opposite side and just, uh, lighten that side up a little bit. This adds a little bit more shape to your overall image. 
Now the other type of local adjustment that I use quite a bit often, not as much as the radio filter, it is the graduated filter. And perhaps one of the most common use cases is across the sky. But before we actually do that, one of the my favorite things to do with the graduated filter is in the foreground. So if I just pull this up, hold down the shift key just to kind of straighten it up to about right there. Let me hit the shortcut key O so I can see what I am working with. And then turn that off again. And I'm just going to bring the exposure down quite a bit, somewhere about right there. And if we toggle it on and off, you can see the difference. This is before and after. And the reason I do that is because I find that if you darken down the foreground a little bit and it transitions into a lighter zone, that creates depth in the photograph and it also draws the viewer's eye into your image. So I do that in a lot of my photographs. But like I was mentioning earlier, perhaps the most common use case is for the sky. So if I come up here to new, drop this down to the horizon line right through here and hit the shortcut key O, see what we're doing and just kind of bring the exposure down a touch Maybe bring the highlights down a little bit right through there, but you'll notice that it is impacting the actual lighthouse right here and the mountains, and that's we, we don't want to do that. And this brings me to the uh, the third essential tool, and I think this is perhaps the the most beneficial upgrade to Lightroom ever, and it's the introduction of range masks. I use them all the time, especially in this uh, this type of a scenario right here. So I'm going to come down to range masks, change this to luminance. I'm going to hold down the option key and just drag this range slider over. And anything in white is gonna receive the edit and anything that is in black is not going to receive it. So I'm gonna pull this all the way over and that created a pretty good mask of the actual sky. And it got rid of the actual uh, lighthouse and the top of the mountain right through there. And now I'm gonna bring down the exposure a little bit more, bring down the highlights quite a bit, maybe even reduce the contrast some, just to soften the sky up a little bit. We can even warm it up a little bit. Maybe even add a little bit of green in there. Just something about like that looks good. And if we just toggle this on and off and before and after. So that definitely made a huge difference, but local adjustments I think are absolutely critical. I could spend the next hour applying all the different types of local adjustments to this image because there was a ton in the final version of this photograph. Now the separate, se separate, the second section of this video is something that I call custom colors. I'm a color guy, I love color in an image. And I think when we all first uh, start using post-processing software, we, we, you, you get accustomed to using the vibrance and the saturation slider, and, that, and that's fine, that's a good first step, and I still use those today. But I like to take it a step further as well. And one of my favorite sections to do that in is in the calibration section. And I, I don't do this on every single image, but whenever there's the color green in one of my photographs, I will almost always jump down to the calibration section. I like to shift greens. If they're real punchy and pop, poppy looking greens, or the green is really popping, I like to shift those greens more towards yellow. And the way I do that is come down to the calibration section and just take the hue of the green primary channel and if you pay attention to all the green areas right through here, you'll notice what's happening. So if I bring it all the way down to about right there, I'm not gonna do it quite that much. And if we toggle this on and off, this is before and this is after. So that made quite a bit of a difference right through there. Maybe increase the saturation some. I'm gonna take the blue primary, the hue. If I bring it all the way to the left, you'll see what it did there, which definitely doesn't look good. But I'm gonna bring it down just a touch right about through there i think looks good and then the next section is in the actual hsl panel which i absolutely love i use this section on every single photograph if i drop this down right through here i'm going to come up to the green channel again and just kind of shift those greens more towards kind of yellow i think that looks good about right there and then the actual luminance channel i love i love luminance luminance is the the brightness value of a of a particular color channel and you can almost, it's almost creates kind of like a dodging effect, like dodging and burning, dodging the uh, the actual color or brightening the color. So if I come over here to the green channel and I bring the luminance all the way up, you can see what that's doing to all the greens in the image. It's brightening up all of those greens like that. So it, in essence, it's kind of dodging the greens, which I love that effect. So I'm going to bring those that quite a bit up as well to somewhere right around there. And then the actual bulb in the lighthouse, that looks yellow. This is pretty cool. If we just kind of bring the luminance up, look what it's doing to the light bulb. It's, it's almost like somebody is in there flipping the switch, turning it on and off. So if we bring it up quite a bit, that's also brightening up the actual uh, lighthouse as well. And is there anything I want to do with the oranges? Maybe bring that up some 
to about right there looks good. And if we toggle this entire section on and off, this is before and after. So the HSL section, the calibration section are absolutely fantastic places to adjust color. But the other, I guess, no, I don't, I don't know. I was going to say that I use this approach more often, but it's not quite as often as HSL and calibration, but it is something I love to do in its actual split toning. I love to have the ability to tone the highlights of a particular color and tone the shadows of a particular color as well. So for this particular image, I'm going to come over here to split toning. I'm going to tone the highlights a warmer color, maybe not quite that warm. I'm going to reduce the saturation some. But I want to kind of get away from how blue the shadows look up through here. So I'm going to come over here to the shadow section and I'm going to tint those that same kind of beige color as well. And you can really see what that did to that area there. If you pay attention to the mountains in the background when I toggle this on and off, this is before and after, before and after. So that kind of got away from a lot of that, that, that really cool looking shadows and added a little bit of warmth in the overall highlights as well. Now the Final essential editing tool for me, I, I feel that this might be perhaps the most underappreciated tool inside of Lightroom, the, the unsung hero of post-processing, and it's the crop tool. And it's a tool that I think almost all of us use on every single one of our photographs. There's multiple different ways to do it. I, I love the actual crop tool. There's just a lot of different ways that you can get creative with your overall image, with your composition. There's different overlays that you can apply. You know, if we wanted to line the lighthouse up, which it already was lined up perfectly in the center, we can take the, the top of the lighthouse and just line it up perfectly in the center if that's what we were going for. Bring it up some, but I, I love all the different crop overlays that you have access to. And I love just the ability to change the composition or alter the composition, actually enhance the composition. That is a better way to say it. But when I'm on location, I actually will find my composition and then I will zoom out a little bit because I want to create some additional real estate around the edges. That way I've, I've got a little bit more room to work from a cropping perspective when I get home and I want to start playing around with that. But the crop tool is absolutely critical to my workflow. I think I would be really in a bad position if I could no longer crop all my images and whatever the, the version was you got out of camera, that was the, uh, the the final crop that you had to go with. I think I would really struggle in that department, but I love the, the overall crop tool. So those are the, I believe that was six essential editing tools and techniques for my post-processing workflow. And I hope that that might help you to uh, possibly pay attention to or start using, I should say, more local adjustments in your uh, uh, post-processing workflow if you weren't already doing that. And also just trying to get a little bit more creative with custom colors as well. And of course, the crop tool. So I do hope that was helpful. Now, before I do wrap up this week's video, I do want to say a just a massive thank you to the uh, the longtime sponsor of this channel now, which is Squarespace, who I use for all of my website and my e-commerce needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery just so you can make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends in page visits and views to better optimize your content. And you can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which will enable you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products or blog posts and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you're looking to start a new website or possibly enhance your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So if you did enjoy this week's video, which I really hope you did, if you could give it that thumbs up, definitely helps the channel out, helps the uh, the video perform better and ring the, the bell notification as well above, just that way you're notified next time I do upload. And if you're not subscribed already, if you could subscribe to the channel, that would definitely mean a lot to me. It would be very much, very much greatly appreciated. That was horrible English, but uh, I think you get what I was saying there. So as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video. And as always, I will see you next Wednesday. Bye.